I'm good. Want to start? Okay. Hi. Hi. Welcome. This is we're talking about Marshall and pickles and how uh, object deserialization is going to ruin your day on Gabe Lawrence. And that's Chris Phil over there. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, we're going to talk today kind of a survey of object serialization vulnerabilities. We'll do some uh, example exploitation scenarios. We have some sample apps, uh, some interesting vectors, and some new tools. All this stuff will be up on GitHub or the bucket uh, after this. And then we'll also end with mitigation techniques, of course. So, um, if you're not familiar with serializing objects, it's basically taking snapshots of these kind of rich. Um, in memory objects and flattening them out into a stream that can be stored or transmitted. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, here's just a kind of a quick list, a non exhaustive list of formats. We have a bunch of binary formats, um, some kind of readable formats at the bottom, and then some in between ones in the middle there. Uh, the ones in the red are the ones we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the yellow ones, you can't really see that well, is, um, those are ones that other people have done some interesting work on in the past that you can find stuff about the references. Uh, and just something to note that the platforms and formats, there may be multiple implementations uh, for serializing things on a given platform for that combination. So we uh, So an interesting thing about serialization is that you, you see it in a lot more places than you'd expect. Um, we've seen it in a lot of different places and assessments. Uh, here's a list of just kind of some general areas you see a lot in communication between processes and systems. And that's usually in the form of wire protocols, web services, and message brokers. Uh, you'll also see it in persistence mechanisms, so databases, file systems, caches, uh, sometimes distributed caches, things like that, Redis, Memcache, etc. Uh, and then you have this uh, other common medium, uh, which are tokens, I'm calling tokens, uh, and that's usually where you have a, a server that's taking a piece of information, handing it off to a client, and then expecting that client to hand it back to you. And those are usually in the form of cookies, uh, form parameters, and off to things. So why do we care? Um, the idea is that, that developers tend to trust these things way more than they should. They're, they look like binary blobs, so therefore nobody's going to mess with it, right? Up here. Uh, so, uh, they, you know, developers tend to assume that, that no one's going to mess with these things, they're going to come back fine. And our job is, as people who are testing apps, is to find those places that there's an appropriate trust and see what bad things we can do with them. So, one of the goals that we're hoping to leave this with is any big binary blob you see anywhere in an application is something we're digging into and figuring out what, what is that data and how can I mess with it. Um, so, We'll jump, jump into some examples now and, and show a little bit what these blobs look like and how to poke at them. Um, all of these things are sort of fi fictional toy examples. We have a bunch of them up on our, our um, respective GitHub and GitBucket locations. Um, so you can grab them and play with them. But even though they're toy examples, they're things that we've seen in the real world, just sort of grabbing that real world app and making it available for you to play with was reasonable. So the first round of kind of vulnerabilities that, that um, we found with these is, is application state manipulation. So the idea is it's very similar to the, what you would do with parameter tampering, where you know the app is giving you something, uh, isn't expecting you to change it, and you can go in and change it. So we'll look at those first just to kind of get an idea a little bit of how, how these things look and how you dig in and, and figure out what they are, and then we'll move on to some more advanced stuff. So here's a, a, a simple app that, that logs you in and uses a serialized object and a cookie to say who you are. So you see this, this strange blob here, and if you're paying attention, the equals equals at the end is usually a pretty good indicator that it's base64 encoded something. Um, so if you base64 decode that, you're going to see that it's a Java serialized object. Um, and the structure for there's a a pretty good write-up that describes what this, this structure is, but we'll give just a little bit. So the idea with serialized objects is they begin with some magic uh, letter here, the ACED is just, this is going to be a serialized object. The 5 is the version, and then um, stuck at the, at the beginning of things is kind of a description of what the class is that's being, been serialized here. Um, and so it begins with sort of the, the class, um, the set of fields and their types, and then at the end of that, it gives the data. 
that's actually in that serialized bit. So there's two fields that are serialized, uh, a, a Boolean value here and a string here. Uh, so you can see this is, it's all right. So this is me and I'm not an admin user at this, at this point in time for this object. And if we change those two values in that and, and put that back in the cookie, we can change who I am. So this is, this is the, the app using that cookie. And then if we flip it to the one we edited, this would, is the result of the app that it's doing that. Um, so there's different types and the same kind of thing in different languages. So this is basically, we'll look at a, a Python version of the same application. Python has sort of three different protocols for pickling things. Um, there's an ASCII one, which is awesome because you can just kind of easily see it. The fields are all separated with new lines, so it's really easy to edit in the text editor. Um, and then there's a binary format. Uh, there's a pretty good write-up here if you want to get into looking at some of the different binary format pieces. Um, so take a look at that. So again, same app. Um, we're putting the serialized object in as the session ID in this, in this case. So instead of storing session on the server, so all the session state ends up being stuffed into a cookie. Again, it's base64 encoded. Um, if you decode it, this is what it looks like. I know I said it was awesome ASCII, but um, we wanted to keep our formats the same from slide to slide. So each one of those things kind of separates out into uh, the values that are being pickled out. Um, so again, we have that admin field that's a zero, so I'm not an admin, and the username is in there. So we can just go ahead and edit that. Read base64 encode it and resubmit it to the app just like we did with the other one. So starting off not an admin and then now Chris gets to be an admin. So that's that's sort of you know your old school, maybe even just flip something in a URL, right? Um, the other and as we move forward with some of these things, you can also change these values and these state things to get the application to behave completely different and do things that it wasn't originally designed to do. Um, so that's just kind of the second class of serialization vulnerabilities that we've looked at. Um, so PHP, we're, we're switching up the languages just to keep it interesting. So. <laughs> PHP has a, a serialization format that uses sort of, uh, it's an ASCII stream with tag. So basically, it's going to have a type specifier, colon, the data, followed by a semicolon. Arrays have an A at the beginning with a colon, the number of things that are in there, with little brackets and the key and values for each of the things that's in an array. And then there's two ways for objects to be serialized. One is it looks just like an array, but it's kind of an O instead of an A. And then the fields are, are in there like the array bent. And then the other way is custom, where there's a function that just reads and writes out the stuff. So you can kind of find it right up here uh, to go into the details on that. So here's what it would look like, again, with a, a similar application. Um, here we have a user object. Uh, it's got a, a protected field as well. Um, that's the, whether you're not an admin, we've added here a, a file path um, that gets created on the server side and then stuffed into this object. It's not something you're supposed to be able to manipulate. And then a uh, username. So in this app, uh, we can go ahead and hit it. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, hit it and log in, and, and we see that there's this stuff. Um, in, in this example app, we, we decided to show something a little bit differently. So go ahead and do the, the next slide. Instead of it being in the actual cookie, we're looking this one's storing all its server side state in memcache. Um, so if you scan the machine, it's got that web, web server open and mem memcache listening. And if you go ahead and connect to memcache, I have a little program here that's also in the GitHub that will connect and just list all the keys that are in there. Um, so we'll run that, and that will give us the key that shows the PHP object. And the cool thing is, um, I think the next slide shows this, but the, the session key here matches the session key that it's setting in your cookie. So you as an attacker, if you can get a hold of memcache that doesn't have any user-based security or anything like that, you can list all the keys in there and find the one you want to mess with. Um, so again, um, that format before, there's that is admin, is admin piece here, uh, the plan, and this one's actually been messed with at this point. So we've turned it to one, and we've changed that, that file that it's looking at. Um, so go ahead. 
So then that one gets submitted. You don't change anything on your client side because it's in the, in the server bit. This, this goes ahead and runs and changes, changes the user to Chris and the admins to yes and pulls that file. So that, that's PHP. Now we'll move to a slightly different one, so Java server faces. This is kind of the one that got us really going on this and looking at, at these things. We ran into this where we had a, a server faces app. And the way, the way server faces works is it uses a view state cookie. Um, and in that view state cookie, there's a large amount of serialized stuff that, that captures the state. And when you put, post that form back, the first thing that they, the framework does is it goes to restore the view. And um, so it reads all the stuff out of that. It sets up all the state on the server side that, that you're posting back. And then um, if it's a form post, it automatically goes and, and sets things on that form post. And as a developer, the way you can specify these things is a, an expression language, which is just a, sort of a, you know, a, a, a very simple uh, object dot property kind of language with some some bits in there, and so you can tie uh, field post value to a value on an object just by saying the object's name and the, the field on that object that you want. So we're going to mess with that. So in this HTML that we have here, we have this form definition, and this form is going to be changing the login beam's name when we submit it, right? So the idea here, it's an update your profile app or something like that. And the developer has gone ahead and used this expression language bit. And um, go ahead. When that gets, oh, yeah, we have a tool. Um, we have a tool that will let you look at the stuff that's in the, the view state in an easier to read way, and then also mess with it. So my creative naming. Um, so this tool will print out uh, this object graph that ends up being serialized in your view state and let you see what kinds of objects are in there. Oh, you want, can you go back to yeah, right. So there's a whole bunch of junk in here. It's a really big blob, um, and it can be a little bit daunting, to, especially if you're looking at it in a binary format to figure out what it's doing. Um, because there's so much there, we'll just jump to the interesting part. So um, there, within there, that, that form field that you saw gets serialized in with the state of what it's going to be updating when it comes to the server side. In your, in your view state. So now you see that expression language bit here ends up being a value expression impl object in the implementation of that that, that is stuffed into your view state. So the, the, the sense you should be getting at this point is what, what happens if I change that to other things on that object? Can I change the way the app behaves? So instead of updating the name, I'm updating some other property of the, the login. So we created a um, a, a simple program that finds all of those instances in that graph and just changes them to whatever expression language you want um, to have in there. So we can run this thing and it will go ahead and kick it. It reads from your uh, clipboard, so making it really easy for you to mess with it. So you copy the view state, you run this thing, it puts the new values on the clipboard with all of your expression languages being updated to whatever thing you want. and. Um, and then it goes, I think we have a video, right? Or uh, this one? Yeah. So here, I'll, we'll go ahead and run the video to show you it doing its interesting stuff. So we go to the app. We'll log in like a normal user. And if you look at it, you'll see uh, we'll go ahead and intercept it, and we'll do the, do the copying of the view state here. So as you see, the view state is this giant blob of, of junk. Um, it's all base 64 encoded Java serialized objects. And we'll go ahead and dump that so you can see what it looks like. So it's pretty big. If you scroll around, and it, you can find those objects that, that we were looking at. There's a, a place in here that sort of shows you what it's being tagged with. If we can get, scroll to the right spot here. So you can see there's a, the value of this thing is being mapped to that login beam.name up there. 
And there's actually a few places where the expression language shows up with other things. So you can kind of actually learn what properties the object has, even if they're not visible on the form, by looking at this if they're used in some elements on that page that don't even show up visibly. It's in the view state. So as long as you're at a page, HTML page that has the form, the view state, that's, it, it's a hidden variable on that page that the framework adds for you. So we're just copying and pasting that and dumping it. It doesn't get max sign or anything? So latest versions do. Okay. Um, older versions don't. And we've seen people turn that off uh, for being able to deal with clustering and stuff like that. So Another interesting thing you'll see as a theme is that uh, often there's things like this where theoretically you can, like you later you see you can do code execution stuff, you can escalate from a path traversal to compromise and think completely. So. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've run the program, it's replaced what's on my paste buffer, and we'll paste the new tampered with view state in. Um, and what we're going to do is change that to change to is admin, and so we'll pass in true instead of my username. And now we're an admin. Does that make sense? Do we go too fast? Okay, good. So now we're going to talk about uh, code execution. Uh, I just wanted to note that uh, we're only going to cover a few things just for time reasons, but there's a lot of interesting work that's been done in this. If anybody remembers the Rails YAML debacle from early 2013, I think it was. Uh, there's also some interesting uh, Java XML stuff. All this stuff's referenced in our references slide, so go take a look at that if you want. We're just going to go over some of the more interesting stuff we've seen. Um, so property-oriented programming. Um, this is something that I have kind of uh, have just been noticing as a trend uh, recently. And only recently found out it was actually a thing that somebody had talked about at, uh, I think it was Black Hat 2010 by uh, Stefan Esser. But basically, it's a code re reuse attack, kind of similar to ROP. Um, you're taking bits of code that are already in the application and chaining them together to do something that it wasn't intended to do. So usually you start off. You know, we use the, we use the term gadget in this case, and you start off with a gadget that kind of starts the chain, and then you have a sync gadget at the end that does your dirty work, usually executing command or something like that, and then you have to find uh, gadgets in between to link those things together. And then the idea is you serialize that chain of objects um, and then send it to a vulnerable application. The application deserializes it, and you exploit that. So uh, I found it to kind of be Rube Goldberg, uh, Rube, uh, sorry, Rube Goldberg, so you can't yes, the yes. <laughs> um, an interesting thing about this is, you know, for a given language, we're going to talk a lot about, um, like Java, for example. These are those mediums I talked about at the beginning. It doesn't care about those. It doesn't care what um, if it's in, uh, you know, a network connection or a file. It works the same way. It doesn't care about what kind of application. It doesn't matter what uh, platform it's on, other than what your command is that you're running. Um, and the important thing to note is that it relies only on the code that is available to the application. So, in the case of a Java application, this would be what things are on the client's app. In the case of like a, a Rails app or a Ruby thing, this would basically be what gems are loaded. Um, and it does not care about what code is actually used or executed by the application. Only what is available. So uh, what I found from uh, the work that we've done is that it's uh, good to target really common libraries and frameworks. Um, if you look at, um, especially in Java and Ruby space, you go open up like a sample app, you know, like a, your pet store app or whatever the demo thing, and it'll have like 40 dependencies because transit dependencies just pull all that stuff in. So there's tons of things to, um, to choose from for gadgets. Um, I found that proxy type gadgets are the most versatile things. Uh, so this would be like Java proxy objects or things in Ruby that have like, method, uh, method missing methods declared. Um, and a handy trick is using deserialization hook methods that are executed in the process of deserialization to actually kick off the chain. And the great thing about that is that basically it all happens before the object ever gets handed back to the calling program. So yeah, I mean I think that's the key thing is that the yeah. frameworks or the the platform that you're running on is, you know, from the developer standpoint, you're saying, read me an object, and then a bunch of magic happens. And so all of the stuff that we're messing with is what occurs during the magic time. 
Yeah. Uh, so I spent a lot of nights just poking around and looking for a gadget and stuff, and it's kind of frustrating. Uh, using IDE like Eclipse helped because it helps you kind of traverse the types and methods and stuff easier. I ended up writing a tool, I'm not going to talk about it today, just for uh, time. Uh, links there, finished it. Um, so I'm going to talk about a uh, Rails gadget chain. Uh, I'm not going to actually show the chain because I have a Java example I'm going to show later, but this was actually something that was discovered uh, by someone and used in as part of one of the YAML exploits that I mentioned earlier. This is actually only part of the chain that was used in the YAML exploit. The YAML version required a bunch of things in front of it for it to execute properly, uh, but it basically uses some Rails utility classes and it targets the Ruby ERB templating system, which uh, you can embed Ruby code into your templating system because why not? Um, so, and this one is not self-executing. This one actually relies on Rails invoking a method on the resulting object after deserialization. Um, so we'll do a quick demo. The other interesting, the other reason we chose this one is because we're actually kind of attacking through a side channel uh, because you'll find that uh, Rails apps will often, as Gabe talked about with PHP, they'll often put uh, your session storage on a backend cache system, so like a memcached or a Redis instance, and that's what we're going to do here. All right, so this is just a really simple application. It just basically stores a word in your session. It's basically just showing that you can store it. So, I'm going to do a quick scan, and we see that the, the standard Redis port is open. So we're going to run some commands to see if we can talk to Redis, and it looks like we can. See which database it's in. Uh, then we're going to enumerate the keys, just to see what's in there. And you can see a couple uh, rail sessions. And then if you check your cookies, you'll note, again, uh, that the cookie value matches the key. So what we're going to do is uh, get, the, get the contents of the key just to take a look at it. You can see it's a bunch of binary stuff. We'll uh, look at it here. So this is actually a hash, and you can see we have the thing, the word that we say, bar, and you can see the CSRF tokens in there and stuff like that. So this is just a few scripts I put together. Uh, this one basically just enumerates all the keys in a Redis instance and shoves a payload into every key. All of this code is something you can go grab later as well. Yeah. So I basically have a reverse shell payload and it shoved it into these two session keys. So now we're going to go back to the web app. We're going to hit um, make a request for that page again to set up our listener hit the page again. It's going to send that cookie. The cookie is going to be looked up. The cookie does be looked up in Redis. It's going to deserialize it and now we have shut. Alright. So this is just a super simple Java uh, gadget chain that I it's totally contrived. Uh, but I just kind of want to demonstrate roughly how this works with a really simple uh, example because it is kind of complicated. So imagine you have these two classes. Imagine they're from completely different libraries, library Y and library X. And basically what we're going to do is wire these two things that were never intended to be used together. We're going to wire them together and serialize them um, and send them over to an application that's doing unsafe serialization and exploit. So I'll just kind of walk through how that works. So, the first thing that happens is the application is using the serialization API, and they're going to be calling the read object method on the object input string. When that happens, it's going to read the description of what object is there in the string. It's going to allocate this cache manager instance, um, which so far has just had a null and hit hook pointer. And then, because this cache manager class declares a read object hook method, it's going to then invoke that method so that the class can kind of do some work to initialize itself. And a, a common thing that um, will happen when uh, this method is implemented is it will call the default read object back on an object stream, and that basically just does the work of what it normally does if you don't implement a read object, it basically just fills out all the fields that were serialized, and this is basically doing that. And then it, 
additionally, it's um, so part one of those fields is the init hook. So it's allocating that command task object that has calc exe as the command. And you can see we're still in default read object down there. And it's kind of small. But next we're going to call run on the object in the init hook field. So now we're up here. And that's going to call uh, runtime exec and pop our calculator. So the idea, right, is that we're finding multiple objects that wouldn't normally be streamed in this way that have behaviors where they set some state inside of those objects that you control and then use that state somewhere. Um, and so, you know, this example only shows these two objects, but that app probably never imagined those two things would be done together. Um, and by putting them in the object stream, we're able to glue them together however we want. Yeah. Where was um, the calc.exe specified in your example code? I, didn't, I missed the line. So, yeah, I didn't actually have the part where it creates the payload. Let's get that. Uh, but basically what you do is you just have code that instantiates these objects and nest them in each other and I guess the command task has a constructor so you just pass it and construct it and then you just, uh, you just serialize it. So the, the string value that was there, is yeah. it, it's the serialized field. Yeah. And if you remember back to the very beginning when we were looking at the Java yes. object serialization, right? So it's got its class and then it's got the field value. So we just shoved that in. We found an object that does that, right? Yeah. Cool. And then and then another object that implements a method, uh, or calls a method in its, in its overridden read object piece. So by, by gluing those together, we have set up state to run a command, and then we have a method invocation that we can use to make that stuff happen. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring it up. You could construct this one just by using regular, normal-looking job code. In, in some of the stuff we've actually found, you have to do some really weird things using reflection, usually to stuff things where they don't belong and kind of bypass the normal APIs. <laughs> we, we decided to do this this small sample one because the chain that Chris has is it's hard to read, <laughs> even if you know what it's doing. So we wanted to kind of describe the general concept and then yeah. Show it so I'm just going to do a, an overview of uh, one of the chains that I found. Actually, I found four. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but oops. So this, um, similar to the example that we showed, targets the runtime exec method. It uses gadgets in the that come out of the box in the JDK, and also stuff from Commons collections. If you've done Java programming, you know that Commons libraries are pretty ubiquitous. Um, and the interesting thing about this one is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's self-executing. So it executes the payload before the application gets a chance to see what the object is. Which is kind of cool. Um, and this. Uh, the only stuff I've seen in the, in the Java area uh, was from these guys that did some cool work. It was actually, uh, I think the gadgets were in spring. Uh, so cool stuff. Those are in the references if you want to check them out. So here's, I just <laughs> put the call chain up. I'm going to show the code for obvious reasons. Uh, you can see there's lots of nested objects. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> Um, I, I, you could probably give a whole 45 minute talk just on stringing these together, but I just kind of want to give you guys an idea of what this looks like. And here's the code that does it. Um, so there's a lot of normal Java stuff, but then at the end here, uh, you can see I'm doing some funny business with reflection to stuff things where they don't belong. Swapping things out. There's a common thing you'll see is you'll, you kind of construct things, and in order to prevent it from detonating on your machine that you're generating the payload on, you have to use like inert objects and then at the very end you kind of art it by swapping things out under the covers. So we have this uh, new tool called Weiss with Serial. And uh, basically this is just a tool that tool utilities for generating payloads of this sort. Uh, it right now has four gadget chains that I found uh, for two different versions of common collections, a spring one and a groovy. So, applications these days, good chance they have probably one of these libraries. Um, so, so this, like, yeah, I mean, the uh, Apache My Faces using some comments collections. Yeah. Uh, so, this is an example of how you, you run it to uh, generate a payload. 
they were just, it's a package as a jar, so you just run a Java jar, you specify the, the payload type, which basically is the gadget chain you're using, what command you want to run. Here I'm just typing in XXD so you can kind of see the same stuff that we've been looking at. And then here I just type it into a file. Um, and then there's a little utility here just as a proof of concept of uh, actually sending a payload to an RMI registry to exploit it. So this is a, a sample of using that same JSF uh, application that the demo did. Actually, you recorded the demo, so you should probably talk to this one. Sure. Yeah, so this is that same uh, Java server faces app we saw earlier where we messed with the uh, view state state internally. But as you remember, the flow for it is uh, reinflate the view state into an object graph and then you know take action on it. So. Uh, all of that stuff we were doing was way harder work than you actually needed to do once you have Chris's awesome uh, gadget finding thing. So we have this big giant serialized object here. What happens if you go ahead and delete all that and replace it with a gadget chain that he has? So we'll go ahead and show that. Um, in this video, I'm going to switch between client and server in the corner there. Um, so the idea is we log in. There's that big set of view state stuff right there. Um, we'll go ahead, actually this is before even logging in, right? But that's the cool thing about having a view state form, it's, that it's right there. So we'll go ahead and run um, Chris's stuff. I wanted to make something show up, so I'm logged in as me on that other machine. So we're going to make this thing send a message, because the, the Java server is running the system. So it goes ahead and, and puts that on the clipboard, because uh, I'm lazy. I don't like to have to type things or copy things. So there's that cool command that just you can pipe it into the clip and it puts it on the clipboard. And as soon as we submit that, it's gone ahead and, and executed that command that we sent at it over on the server. Yeah, and this is interesting here. Uh, this is a 500 error, and it's probably a class cast exception because right. the object we returned was not what it was expecting, but at that point it was too late. I think it's actually, it couldn't find the view state. Oh, okay. That's what it says, yeah. So if you look at your logs and you see a lot of, hmm, couldn't find the view states. Sometimes that's because things timed out. Sometimes that's because Chris is busy here more today. <laughs> All right, here's a, another simple example. Uh, this is actually that from my registry exploit uh, demonstration. Something I should note is that, like traditionally, you would generally find RMI registries um, set up in such a way that this wouldn't work. Usually there's a class loader hierarchy in Java and the, this would, uh, the RMI registry would be only loading classes from the system class loader which wouldn't contain gadgets generally unless we find a holy grail of a gadget chain that's all JDK classes which would be awesome but haven't any like that yet. So, um, but you might find this in um, like application servers like a, a JBoss, so we haven't really looked yet but um, something that starts its own RMI registry up. Applications sometimes do this so we kind of wanted to get the idea across as part of this that um, there are lots of places that serialized objects show up and, and part of looking at an app, looking at all the different layers can yield some pretty valuable stuff. Yeah, so we started the vulnerable uh, R line. And talked about that. It's cool. It's kind of, a, kind of a dull demo just because <laughs> Like doesn't do much and it just works, which is kind of the neat part about it actually. It's because the frameworks are all doing that deserialization for you, and that magic happens and you get to win. You need to add some noise so it looks harder. <laughs> 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 um, all right, so some limitations and caveats. Uh, as I mentioned in the last demo, you can only use what classes are available to the application. So if your application that you're targeting does not have one of these that are all the classes required for a gadget chain uh, on the class path, then you're out of luck. Um, so that's the same thing as that first item under Java serialization. Um, in Java, it's a little more tricky because you have to worry about types. Um, it will only serialize things that um, implement a serializable or externalizable interface. So that kind of limits what you have to use uh, as far as gadgets. Uh, the other thing you have to worry about is it's pretty strict about version checking with serialization. So um, there's this thing called serial new ID, and I can get into details, but basically you can change your object structure sometimes, that ID will change, and if you try to generate 
uh, serialized payload on one machine and then deserialize on a different machine that's a different version of the library, sometimes it'll break. So it's usually if it adds a field or changes a yeah. field type. So that magic ordering of what fields do I pull out of that stream in the, de the default serialized object would change. Yeah. That then changes that ID so that it knows that it's trying to deserialize the wrong order of stuff. And luckily, best practice usually dictates that you manually input yeah. that in people so, using Yeah, developers don't change that very much. So. Yeah. Um, and of course, you have uh, static type constraint, uh, constraints you have to work uh, within when you're constructing data chains. You can only, you know, you can only invoke a method on the object if it actually is of the same type of the variable that you're trying to invoke it through, things like that. Um, so, and then as far as web frameworks, a lot of stuff we've talked about is kind of uh, normally you would find these web frameworks are using signing with stuff, but it is not uncommon to see them not doing things right. So just keep an eye out for it because you will see it. If you roll back one version um, on the spec, and it, it didn't say do this by default. Um, so JSF stuff prior to that um, on the Majora side did, didn't do it up until the spec changed. On the MyFaces side, it started doing it at MyFaces 2.0. Um, but as I said, we, we run into apps where they've turned that off because they're clustering and that broke things. They kept getting these data errors and that's the turning the encryption off was the easiest way to solve it. So, yeah, that's cool. Yep. And like I said before, <laughs> if you find a path traversal, basically escalate to the execution on a lot of these things that use serialization. So, right, you, you just have to find the file that has the keys and then you can sign error states. Yeah. All right. So, I talk about mitigation. You want to do this? Sure, jump in on that. Okay. So don't don't do this. <laughs> don't don't give people things you can't trust. Right. Uh, so uh, one of the ch challenges is is that you know if you're using the the platform's object serialization, you're kind of going to this black box to do a bunch of important stuff about the state of your of your uh, your system that you can't control. It's wonderful from a developer standpoint. It's like one line, cool, I get a whole bunch of objects back and I don't have to think very hard. So I totally understand why, in fact, I've written apps that this stuff would totally destroy. So uh, I totally understand how you get that. But I, I think you know our advice is don't use the, the super dangerous Pandora's box of object serialization for stuff. Do something that, that is much more simple and allows you to control what kinds of objects are being created and verify the state before they're turned into executable objects. Um, also, you know, keep the stuff on the server, but if you're doing that in a scalable way, you've probably got some kind of Redis or Memcache or whatever, and if some other machine in your DMZ gets popped, that's potentially offering a, a, a neat side vector for them to do lateral movement, or if your firewall rules break, everybody gets that opportunity. So. Um, I can talk about this one. So the um, another step you can take is trying to, at a code level, you can try to restrict the serialization. This is kind of difficult without explicit support from the library. Um, you can kind of hack in in a few cases. Uh, the idea is you want to preferably whitelist what classes you're allowed to be deserialized, um, or blacklist dangerous ones if you can't whitelist. Uh, you want to try to constrain things as much as possible to the types that you're expecting. Uh, obviously, you have an advantage if you're using static types. Um, if you're not, you're out of luck on that. And we didn't talk about it, but uh, in some of these formats, you can actually do schema enforcement. So like uh, XML or JSON, theoretically, you could kind of validate that it conforms to some schema before you even try to deserialize it. So just wanted to kind of give some simple examples of how you might do this in Java. Um, you can implement very simple blacklisting and whitelisting by uh, subclassing the object input stream, which is kind of how you interact with the serialization API. You'll write the resolve class method. You basically look at the class that's being passed in, and you throw an exception if it's not one that you are expecting to serialize. It's a bit of a hack. And the big problem that you brought up with this when we were talking about it is that you know, if this is part of a framework that's doing that call, you don't really have a hook to say, no, don't use the regular deserial object uh, input stream, uh, use ours. Uh, so you have to do some real crazy magic to yeah. trick it into doing that. So yeah, it can be difficult. Uh, in Ruby, I played around a little bit, I didn't have a lot of time, I didn't see any clean way to do it. Um, an idea I had was maybe punk, uh, monkey patching the Marshall hook methods that kind of get called during serialization just to throw an error 
uh, that kind of interrupts the guided chain before he gets a chance to execute it. I don't know. PHP, you're definitely out of luck. So Python ha actually has two different sets of libraries that will pickle stuff for you. Um, and oh, by the way, there, there is a remote code execution of Python that's relatively well known, so we just didn't talk about it, where you can serialize something in a distance system exec. Um, there's links, and we have a demo for that one too on, it, on the site if you want to play with it. Uh, but so the idea, uh, there's two different ways to pickle. Uh, one of them uh, has kind of a cleaner way to, 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 hick it, uh, to hack it into protecting it. Both of these are actually covered in the Python documentation, so you can look at it, but it's, it's the same thing, where you override the, the read object and, and have it only create objects that, that follow a whitelist of some sort. So, obviously you want to authenticate, uh, we talked about this a little bit already, and to be clear, it's a common mistake. Encryption is not the same thing as authenticating. If you are just encrypting and you're not using authenticated encryption, you are doing it wrong. So make sure you're actually authenticating. You use authenticated encryption or an HMAC or something of that sort um, to authenticate your content. Um, if you can use authenticated channels, TLS with client certs or using credentials with whatever system you're storing stuff in. Um, and the key thing is it, this all has to happen before deserialization happens. If you deserialize the object and then check credentials that are in the object, it's too late. <laughs> So, uh, and then obviously don't leak your crypto keys. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the key here, right, is uh, your, your web app is dependent on other pieces of infrastructure, so make sure they're locked down. Um, just, you know, a lot of the sort of memcache type of systems out there don't have significant amounts of security around them. By default, they sort of expect you to firewall rule and limit that that way. Um, so being really careful about how you set those up so that people can't use those to then stuff bad objects in them and execute stuff. Potentially even signing the stuff that you're putting in there may be a, a key mitigation to do. Um, with with uh, environments, um, you want to sort of sandbox what they can do and see if you limit um, what, what these objects or what these gadgets can do when, when they actually fire off, right? So if you had a Java security manager that prevented you from executing stuff, your, your account would never launch or your message box would never go. Um, similar things with PHP and Python and, and those pieces where you can limit sort of the, the overall scope, um, even you know, Cheroot environments and stuff like that can be useful in the space to deal with stuff. But you're sort of trying to close the gate or close the barn after the horses are out with that. With that. Um, so it's a little bit rough to, to really feel good about it. But, it, you know, it's all important stuff to make sure you get it done. All right, so something you don't want to rely on is getting rid of these gadgets. Uh, as I said uh, before, it, some of these applications have I've seen apps with hundreds of um, dependencies. If you look at like JBoss itself, I think it was 300 jars it had in there. So yeah. like, there's always going to be stuff to find. What we want to stress is the vulnerability is in the code, the application code that is doing the unsafe deserialization. Playing whack a mole and getting rid of the gadgets is not how you want to go. You're often going to find gadget chains that combine things across different libraries. So who's going to fix that? Um, it's really hard to find these things in an automated manner. I've tried to write tools and it's not easy to do some non-trivial uh, data flow stuff. So, yeah, don't, don't rely on this. Um, so future work, um, there's more work than we can do. I don't have time to pull this stuff, but there's lots of unsafe serialization out there. There's lots more gadgets and chains to find. Uh, I'd like to do some improvements on the tools to help uh, make it easier to find this stuff. Uh, but like I showed in the beginning, there's a giant list of formats and platforms, um, and places where you can find this. Just you know, go look for these things. They're out there. I think in the assessments that I've done, probably a third of them have had at yeah. least one of these things in it. It's Chris's favorite trick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a bunch of references. Um, there's some great stuff uh, in there, some of the great work that people have done. And then. I think, well, do you look at that list and you think, wow, there's a lot of work that's been done here? I think there's still, you know, going to Chris's point, there's still tons of stuff out there. It's not like this is a, an overly fished bond at this point. Yeah, 
But I mean, I look at it more like a class, but it's like a classic app set thing. It's like a cross site scripting thing. It's you're intrinsically you're doing it wrong. It's not a vulnerability in the specific thing. It's you just need to do things correctly. Yeah. So here's a link to the sample code that we showed you today. Um, the tools at the bottom. Uh, the tool I just talked about was Wiso Serial. Um, you guys still have to click some radio boxes to make my not have it right now. Yeah. So you immediately run out of click. <laughs> Uh, so that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yep. Do you see anything with uh, Gatsby or like the JSON library? Like, is there anything you can do with uh, with deserialization not of objects but with data structures? So, well, Gatsby does uh, XML and it transforms from XML to and from objects. So. JSON does a good job of doing the type, type constraint. It, it basically, either you generate your objects from your schema or you generate your schema from your objects. So in most cases, it will probably be difficult to, to exploit because they keep the type. So, so just get to arbitrary code execution, right? But that yeah, yeah. That get to the point where you're looking at what's that logic flow of the app. Yeah. Can I change some internal state that, that lets me do something I shouldn't have been able to do, right? So, Maybe it's not as awesome as remote code execution, but you still may be able to get some win at moving, you know, pri privilege escalation within the app or seeing data you shouldn't see or uh, you know yeah. those, those kinds of things. So as far as other stuff, uh, XML, some really interesting work was done by these guys in uh, here with Xtreme and XML encoder, and those are situations where they did something a little bit more simple as far as like gadgets and stuff, but uh, they did use XML libraries and lie to. Uh, the class. Basically, if you see a class name anywhere in a stream, it's probably bad. I haven't found this anywhere yet, but I'm looking for it because I think it's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. Is if, if you have like a Jaxby thing where it doesn't have the thing set properly for entity uh, resolution restriction, and you can do a, a remote file include or kind of thing with what is it, XXE? I forget oh, yeah. what that stands for off the top of my head, but do an XXE attack there to pull the crypto key thing or you know other things out of it. Which might be a lot of fun. There's a lot of interesting ways to combine this with other attacks. Yeah. Um, JSON, this is, like I said, this is another area to explore. It's in JSON, I know Jackson, at least in one mode, allows you to magically serialize any object and it will actually right. encode the class name into the JSON. In, in Ruby, okay. it was a couple of years ago, so the Ruby gem for JSON, uh, it made a change, like some version a couple of years ago. They used to, by default, like deserialize into any object and it was. Exactly. Yes, kind of deep and clean, orderly. And they made a minor version update, and it broke everybody's shit. Because <laughs> it should have made a minor update. Right. But that was yeah, that's a big example. Like just two years ago, less than two years ago, it was a big Ruby thing. The old Ruby apps are, are still very. Um, the challenge here, right, is that as a developer, I want all this stuff to work, right? Yeah. I want to be able to just have a magic make, make my object go out there and make it come back. And, and this, that's wonderful. Eyes. A lot of complicated stuff I don't have to worry about. Um, so, sort of the security and, and developer desire are in complete tension with each other. Yeah, just for clarification. So, Jackson and these, uh, if I want to just, I can show that now if you can Jackson more, pretty much, because it's in the schema. So, how does it compete for, compared to this? Try to do like a similar attack using Jackson. Yeah, so it all depends on the behavior of the code that's deserializing it. So, like I said, I think there's only one specific mode in Jackson, for example, that will allow you to deserialize arbitrary objects. I think by default it acts more like JaxB, uh, where it is looking for very specific types. But it's, a, it's an area for further research. So, you know, just, just doing this stuff just in this one area is a ton of work. Uh, but there's tons more stuff to be found, I'm sure. Did you say why is this serial? Yeah, I didn't push the code. I figured I'd wait till after. So I'll do that right now. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, it seems like, so there are two parts to this, right? Like first the serialization library is just terrible, like YAML and Pickle. Uh, but in addition, if we just had always uh, authorized, uh, authenticated, then, so I wonder if like, uh, languages should just by default authenticate with some secret yeah. and the job of the security person would just be like, let's make sure our secret is actually secret. But uh, other yeah. than that, like, 
every time you serialize or deserialize, the, the runtime always authenticates, yeah. right? right? Because that also protects against, I think there's this DEF CON talk on fit flips and all these random issues in serialized. Sure. Uh, so yeah, that's what I was saying, that it's important to authenticate and not just encrypt. So. Right. Yeah, but I'm wondering, it's just like Python should just, like, we should go to a widow that, hey, yeah. Python should always do this. Like, it's <laughs> tricky. The challenge there, right, is so Django does this with, the, with its, its setup. Yeah. Um, it does that automatically, but it, it also generates the the key when you build your your yeah. Django template files, and then people commit that into GitHub yeah. um, and yeah. share it. So you may be someone who's like, oh, there's this neat app, I want to deploy it. None of those that I looked at had instructions of go and change this. Some of them may be buried in the settings file itself that said go and change this, or the, the key was go and change this. But it's really easy for someone to miss that when they're setting stuff yeah, up. But so. I guess I was yeah. thinking more on the like, so like most people in this room are either like the security engineers in this room are actually working for companies, and like it's a it's like if I was an engineer, it's a much more tractable problem to ensure that we're not yeah. leaking keys to GitHub than it is to make sure that people are using. No, it's <laughs> no, I don't disagree. Not, I, I think it is a good point. It, it, it would help a lot. It would raise the bar significantly. I think had it having that. Plus having clear API to sort of limit or control what you what you can serialize okay. um, gets you to a much safer place. Now making sure people do those things right is still a challenge. It'd be a much better state than we're in today. Anybody else? Right. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much.